Uh, I had the privilege of meeting our next speaker and his lovely wife, Penny, when I came to Claremont, California in the fall of 1994 uh, to study for my PhD in political science. At the time, he was president of the Claremont Institute. Uh, he didn't teach any formal classes back then, but he was always teaching, whether in conversation or in his speeches. And uh, I learned a lot. As many of you know, uh, if, you, if you claim to know something in his presence, that makes you something of a ripe target. Uh, you can ask our, our students today at Hillsdale, who uh, he'll drop in on from time to time at the lunch table and ask them questions like, so what is the good? Um, and like any good teacher, he wasn't afraid to tell you if he thought you were wrong, which he did to me quite frequently. Uh, so back then when I was younger and sillier, I used to joke that he was a um, college professor trapped in a think tank president's body. I guess that makes him a, a professor trapped in a college president's body now. Uh, of course, all joking aside, those two things go together uh, at Hillsdale as they used to, at least, at uh, most other colleges and universities. Uh, in addition to serving as the 12th president of Hillsdale College, he, he teaches courses on various topics, including the Constitution and Aristotle. Uh, he's the author of several books, uh, most recently, Churchill's Trial, Winston Churchill and the Salvation of Free Government. It's been my privilege and honor to work with him at my alma mater now for almost 16 years. Uh, his topic today is education and politics. Please welcome to the podium Hillsdale College President Larry Piarn. Thank you, Tim. Tim was a tremendous young man back then, as he is a tremendous man today, but he still confuses the term stature and size. <laughs> I've been having a wave the last few days of missing Ronald Reagan. Do you miss him? Yeah. And uh, mine was provoked by, uh, I go on the radio and talk about the election all the time, and haven't got a position in, on the election that I'm prepared to announce. I'm in the college business and I know things about it, so I talk about those things. And what I succeed in doing is making everybody mad. Uh, but um, I watched, and it was probably not judicious. I, I went and looked up Reagan's speech after his speeches after his primary victories. And uh, the main one that made the big impression was when he won the whole thing. And uh, his first words were, he walked up and he had that big smile, and he said, this is the most humbling moment in my life. And then he stopped for a while. You see, if you go read his first inaugural address, that's the opening theme. And then the end of that, very, they're brief remarks, but they were just dynamite, is like the end of his, his First inaugural, he says, um, this is a very troubled time and we are in danger. He said, but we are Americans still and so we are not afraid. And he said that with such firmness, you see, and he was telling us, this is our country. Uh, that's why we miss him, and also we miss him because he addressed the crisis that we're in thematically. It's still the same crisis. And I will say that the intensity of this election, which I have actually been enjoying for the first time since uh, Reagan ran, is because there are people in this race who do address this crisis thematically. I'm very aware that this could be disaster for us and that we may have a disaster no matter what, what happens in this election. This, I think, is the third great crisis in the history of our country after the American Revolution and the Civil War. I think this might be the age in which we lose control of our government. But I also think we should remember that back when Reagan started, you couldn't know for sure that he was going to turn out to be Ronald Reagan. Uh, it's hard to tell. Aristotle says, power shows the man. So I begin with the point we should be hopeful. Very important to do that. Sooner or later, 
we're going to fix this. For one thing, my college won't be able to go on if we don't. And that's not a supportable idea. It is going to go on. I'm going to make three points. Uh, this is an intense election because we're in a crisis, and I'm going to explain what that is. I'm going to say that this crisis began in the world of education and has afflicted the world of education almost to the place of destruction, and that the solution to the crisis in education and the solution to the crisis in politics are the same solution and deeply related to education. So those are my three points. Uh, the word crisis means turning, turning from one thing to another. It means if we, that, that we're going to be either the same thing having turned back to it, or we're going to be something different when we're finished. That's how serious it is. And uh, I'm going to give you a tool to understand things like this. This is like political science 101, and excuse me for doing it, but I find the argument I'm about to explain to you very beautiful, and uh, I hope you do. So in the metaphysics, Aristotle says that anything human beings produced, and can also anything in nature, but just stick with things pr uh, humans produce, can be understood by the four things that make it what it is. It's four causes. Uh, everything, think of a statue. I was taught this by a very great man who died last year. Both my teachers died last year, Harry Jaffa and Martin Gilbert. I was so lucky in both of them. They're very different kinds of people, but both awesome. And Harry Jaffa explained this to me, and he explained it in, uh, in regard to what he regarded as the greatest statue. Have you ever seen Michelangelo's David? Isn't it awesome? Well, it has a material cause. It's made of white marble. And that changes a lot of things about it. Because if it was made of bronze, it would look different. You know, if it was made of green plastic, it would look different. The United States has a material cause. This land and the people who live in it. And they are a unique opportunity in history. Not only had such a thing never happened before, but it can never happen again. And what was the thing? What it what was was that a civilization highly developed moved to a new continent. There aren't any more new continents. This continent, nobody knew what was there. In fact, Washington named his army the Continental Army, but it was not until more than 20 years later that any representative of the United States ever crossed the continent to actually see how big it was. It was this vast new world, and as far as they knew, it was empty. And the people who came, they brought with them enormous things, right? learning, the Bible, books, tools, all of that. But when they first got here, they didn't have the capacity to make any of that. What they did also bring, what, that, what changed was the aristocracy, the hierarchy of things, of people and things that had prevailed in the old world, that was wiped out and everybody got to start over. If you like Western movies, uh, Doug Jeffrey over there is a great expert on Western movies and other extremely important things, but that may be the most important that he knows about. He, he will tell you that Liberty Valance, the man who shot Liberty Valance, is a very great one. And what, what is it about? They're on the frontier, and there are two kinds of rule. There are guns, and there are law books. And nobody in that town could make either a gun or a law book. They came from before. And they brought them with them, and now they're on the frontier, and they have to work out the relationships again to get the law books in charge of the guns. That's what the talk was about last night, by the way. You see, so the material cause of America is this unique opportunity of land and people. And then things have a, a uh, efficient cause. Michelangelo made the David. It was hard to do, right? It's manual labor to sculpt in marble. You gotta chip away. 
he said, you know, you take, you take apart away the parts of the rock that are not the statue. <laughs> I wish it were so simple. But then we wouldn't revere Michelangelo so much, right? Him working away. That's the efficient cause. The efficient cause of America is the people who built it. And you know, the leaders of those people are very remarkable people and you can read what they did and why they did it. Because they were ex particularly explicit, careful to explain what they were doing. There's no founding of any country so well documented or explained as the founding of the United States of America. And of course there were huge arguments about it. But they did that. They did it. And then things have a formal cause. So that's the efficient cause, the person who did it. Him doing it. Them doing it. Her doing it. There were some hers, of course. Else there wouldn't have been any hymns. <laughs> you can say, men come first, but that's stupid. <laughs> don't you have mothers? <laughs> or, don't you have wives? <laughs> so then there's the formal cause. That's what it looks like. Michelangelo's David looks like David. He was a boy. He was chosen by God to do a mighty task. He's got really big hands in, in the statue. He needed to sling those stones, you see. Long arms, a kind of innocent and yet firm countenance, right? You could, the, the qualities he had, you know, sort of divinely appointed to do a great heroic act. You could have a statue of a horse that, that looked like that. There have been horses who've been appointed to great deeds and celebrated in poems and songs. But if David had been a horse, it wouldn't look the same, right? The formal cause is that boy. And then there's, what's the formal cause of the United States of America? How do you see the United States of America? How does it act? The answer is, it acts as a people through three branches of government. And that gives it its form. And back when those branches worked the way they were supposed to, they were very distinct. So it was, when it was time to figure out what to do about a thing, then the Congress would deliberate and argue and then pass some law. And we would know what the law was and we would follow the deliberations. And it used to be that the laws passed in Congress were the only laws that there were. And you know, Congress still today passes about the same number of laws that it passed 150 years ago. Of course now there are thousands of laws passed every year, but not through Congress anymore. That's a change in form of the government. And then when the, when the government got ready to do something, to act, then that's in the White House. The president acts, he executes, a very interesting word. And then, and then when there's a dispute and an argument between people or between people and the government or one part of the government and the other, then somebody judges and that's the Supreme Court. And what does that tell you except that the structure of the Constitution itself, it's divided into those three parts plus four others. The others, you know, there's, it goes legislative, executive, judicial, then there's one about the states, then there's one about ratifying the Constitution, I may get the last three in wrong order, one about ratifying the Constitution, one about the transition from the old to the new Constitution, and one about the amending process. The Constitution of the United States is the form of the government of the United States. And it is reflected in the way Washington DC looks because the great buildings, the old buildings, which are all very beautiful and designed according to a common theme. Have you noticed in pictures of Hillsdale College that Hillsdale College looks like itself? You know, we've built a lot of buildings. You can't tell it. People say to me, some of these buildings are new, aren't they? And I say, yeah, pretty new. And they say, who built them? And I said, well, Autumn, we built them. And they said, they look like the old ones. I said, yeah, they do, don't they? Huh? The college has a point. It should look like it has a point. We don't think at the college, like, you know, I'm in the college president game, which is 
a questionable profession. And, and uh, it's very common among them that when they get to build a building, you know, because first of all, that's their legacy. They get their name on it. My name is not on any of the buildings. And, and then they like to build them so that they look different than the others. So everybody can recognize theirs, right? Hillsdale College is not built that way, new or old. And Washington, D.C., old is not built that way. There's a place for each of those things. And that place is lovely, and it is designed to accommodate those things. Now, the form of the government, I just told you, it has changed because all those three functions of execution, legislation, and adjudicating, they've now been decentralized. But they're, but, and so they're located in hundreds of places all over the, uh, the, the administrative agencies of whom I've never been able to, of which I've never been able to discover an accurate list. I don't know that such a list could even be made. But if you look in Washington, it's changed the face of Washington, D.C. They've built many, many more buildings than they used to have, and they are in a different form. They, they are made to house a different kind of functionary. And what's in the new buildings wouldn't fit in the old buildings. There's no place for that kind of thing. These functionaries, by the way, are bureaucrats and the buildings look like bureau. They look like the top of those roll top desks with the pigeonholes, right? You can tell what's constitutional. If it's in a pretty building, it is. And if it's in an ugly building, it isn't. <laughs> it's true. I mean, it's, it's not simply true, but it's mostly true. So the form has changed. And then there's this cause that matters more than any other. And that's the final cause. What is the final cause of a thing? Well, have you ever been to the Sistine, looked at the Sistine ceiling, been in the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican? Did you know that Michelangelo is up there? He put himself there. And what he is, he appears as an emptied out skin. And uh, I don't know why he did that exactly. But I do know that that was a great struggle to him. It was hard for him to do everything he did. He gave his life to it. He sweated over it. He broke his health over it. He emptied himself out for it. Why would he do that? The answer is love. He loved things. He wished to represent them. He wished to pay homage to their beauty. He wished to make them visible to us. He could see them, and he wanted it for us to see them. Go see the David. It's in Florence, and it's in a big building, big museum, and you turn a corner, and you look down a hallway that's longer than to that thing right there, and the hallway has arches on either side, very beautiful, and various of his sculptings are on one side and another as you walk, and the ceiling is very high and arched, and at the end of it stands this very tall statue at the top of a very high plinth. And when you stop and look at it, you just stop and you just say, goodness gracious. We took a cruise to Rome and Florence, and the stupid cruise line proposed to take off Florence after it was all set up. And we called them. And you know, a whole bunch of people were coming on this cruise line with us, and we said, you know, you can go wherever you want to go, right? But I can tell you, 300 and some of your guests are going to Florence because they need to see the David. You know, what are you fools? And they changed the itinerary back, right? So you see what that means? That means that the beauty of the David drew us as it drew Michelangelo. The thing you love, the beautiful thing that you love, that's the answer to what do you live for and what would you die for? What is that in America? Abraham Lincoln says, uh, every nation has a central idea from which all its minor thoughts radiate. That's classical philosophy. 
put to English poetry, which is what he could do. In this country, he says, it is the idea that all men are created equal. No one is born with a saddle on his back or another booted and spurred to ride him by the grace of God. In America, it's possible to grow up in Pocahontas, Arkansas, the son of a school teacher, and absorb with the milk that you drink that you can do anything. Anything you try hard enough to do and have the talent for. You see, the only check is nature itself and your own industry. And nobody, I can't remember anybody saying that to me, but I can't remember any conversation that was not built on that premise when I was growing up of any importance. You see, it's what the nation loves. I'm saying there's a change in that, and it started in education. I'll read it to you. This is in our Constitution Reader. You can learn all this stuff. By the way, it's 650 pages. Everything I've said so far is in that book. Just read those 650 pages, and then again, and again, and again, and again. This is a man named Frank Goodnow. He was uh, one of the founders of modern progressivism. He was, what was he, he taught at Columbia with John Dewey. He became head of Johns Hopkins. He was one of the founders of the American Political Science Association, of which I am proud to be a dissenting member. <laughs> we, uh, in 1984, uh, several friends of mine, one is in this room, were at the American Political Science Association and they took a straw poll of the gathered 2,000 political scientists, Reagan versus Mondale. And Mondale got 94%, and Reagan got less than half the rest. And so there were four or five of us, and we were having a drink, and we said, I, I think I might be the one who said it, I said, so 2% of the people here are for Reagan. I bet we can name every one of them <laughs> sitting at this table. And we made a list, and we could. <laughs> that means that it's probably true today. Every political scientist who's conservative in America is probably known to me and my closest friends. We're dissenting members. Good now writes, the political philosophy of the 18th century was formulated before the announcement and acceptance of the theory of evolutionary development. The natural rights doctrine, that's like laws of nature and of nature's God say that you have these self, that it's a self-evident truth that you have these rights, you know, that old-fashioned claim. The natural rights doctrine presupposed that society was static or stationary rather than dynamic or progressive. It was generally believed, if you can believe it, at the end of the 18th century that there was a social state which under all conditions and at all times would be ideal. The rights which man should be that, the rights which man had were believed to come from his creator. Curious idea. These rights consequently were the same then as they once had been and would always be the same. But now everything is different. By the way, do you, do you catch the tone of this? This means that he expects his audience to agree with this. This is all in the past tense, you see. Now we know the accumulation of capital, the concentration of industry, all that stuff is new. And because it's new, all the principles have to be new. And it was foolish ever to think otherwise. You see? That means the thing he loves, Frank Goodnow, is something different than the thing that Thomas Jefferson loved. It means that the final cause 
is different. And what does that mean for the formal cause? You know, the structure of things. Here's Woodrow Wilson, friend and colleague of a kind with good now, the only academic to be president of the United States, a bad idea. Jefferson wrote, this is Woodrow Wilson writing, of the laws of nature, and then by way of afterthought, end of nature's God. I don't know why he says that's an afterthought. They constructed the government as, as they would have constructed an orrery, which is, you know, we're old, right? So in class, we turned a crank, and the planets went around the sun, and the moon goes around the earth, chains, hook it all up. There was a time when people thought that was really cool. The Constitution was founded on the law of gravitation. The government was to exist and move by virtue of the efficacy of checks and balances. The trouble with the theory is that government is not a machine, but a living thing. It falls not under the theory of the universe, but under the theory of organic life. It is accountable to Darwin, not to Newton. You heard Goodnow say they didn't really know about social evolution, right? And that's why they didn't know how things are. So as the final cause must change, Wilson and Goodnow say, so the formal cause must change. We must have a different kind of government. Now, I'll tell you why that matters in very specific terms. The old thing, which was in fact written under the laws of nature and nature's God, and was in fact thought that this is the form of government that will prove to accord best with human nature, the old thing did a very remarkable constitutional arrangement. It is, in my opinion, one of the few, but there are few, really dramatic inventions in America. Inventions, they thought, better to accord with how things are. And it's this, they, they designed this big government, and if you just imagine the whole society is a big circle, and the government is a little circle in the middle of it, or on an edge, right? And for most of American history, the government's been about 10% of the gross domestic product of the country. And, and the 10%, uh, if you divide it into that, that circle into into segments, the biggest segment would be local government, and the next big, biggest segment would be state government, and the smallest segment would be the federal government. All that's reversed now. So it's much bigger, and it's much more centralized. But because this big circle, and then this little circle, because they were different, they could have relations. And the first constitutional check is that all of the sovereignty all the legitimate power to rule is placed in the big circle among the people, but all the power to act is in the little circle, in the government. So just think what that does. That places a check on us. We have all the power, but we can't act, except at election time. It's the reason today is important, and November more important, right? But then inside the government, they're checked because they don't really have any authority of their own. There's nobody in there named King, for example, who's the sovereign. And the people don't meet as the legislature to pass the laws. And so they're always dependent for their authority on the thing outside. And that, in my opinion, is the first step in the key to the Constitution of the United States. And there are a few other steps, and they're all like that. And they're wonderful, and that's why the Constitution has lasted so long. But now, if you just imagine that the little circle becomes a little more than half the whole, as it, as it has, so now the little circle is the big circle, and all the powers of government are in there, then all of a sudden, the government is an enormous factor in the electoral process. It's huge. And the danger is that people will be overwhelmed by that. That is what I think is the specific danger that we face today. And how are we going to break out of it? Well, that's what this election is about, and that's what people are talking about in this election, including some of the candidates.
Here's something Frank Goodnow wrote about education, because you'll see that these are exactly the same thing, politics and education. You see, well, I'll tell you that in a minute. He writes, we teachers perhaps take ourselves too seriously at times. We may not have nearly the influence we think we have. Changes in economic conditions for which we are in no way responsible bring in their train, regardless of what we teach, changes in beliefs or opinions. Do you get that point? It means that you sit in the classroom and you learn. Have you heard me quote two of my teachers today? And I'm an old man now, and the teachers have just died. Very old men when they died, right? But I remember, like it was yesterday, many of the things they said to me. And you know, several of them I live my life by. They give shape to this thing that I'm saying right now. And in, in my life, I have students now. And I've been doing it for 16 years, and so some of them are grown, and some of them are important. And I'm like their dad. Like their dad in this, too. They're getting to the place now where they start telling me what to do. And they, they have an expression for me when they do that, because some of them are very powerful people now. And some of them are powerful people in politics, where I have certain influence. And uh, they all get to uh, advising me and confining me and saying, make sure you do it this way, you know, because I'm going to go talk to their bosses and their big powerful staffers now. And, I, and I'll say, well, okay, who are you talking to again? And then not long ago, I overheard one of them say to another one, well, he never has been a tame lion, has he? <laughs> I'm very proud of that, right? I'm very proud of the fact that they try to tell me what to do. This relationship is sacred. It's joyous, it's wonderful. And good now says, no, what they think is going to be dominated by the principles around them, by the, sorry, not principles, the conditions around them. Do you see what that means? That's what evolution is about, social evolution. It's about the idea that as conditions change, our thoughts conform. And that means there isn't any nature to study. The AP guide, Calvert, I'm pretty sure, found it for me. And then he lost it and I gave it back to him, so I returned the favor. In secondary literature, it goes like this in the introduction written by a professor from Agnes Scott College. This may be, by the way, out of date. This one was published in 99. But it's not out of date. The new one will be worse. It says, uh, we used to think that there was literature, but now we know there are only literatures. Objectivity and factuality are out the door. Now we teach students. So first of all, have you read Shakespeare? Was it easy? Have you read it enough so it did become compelling? Because that's the process. Because he's, you know, he's very great. He, he's, he's probably the best. He's probably like Michelangelo. Probably like Rembrandt. God made them messengers. They can tell us things. And when you see that for the first time, then the archaic language turns into music and it swells. But. It doesn't start that way. Now, at first, it's complicated and old-fashioned sounding. And everybody thinks it's that way when they start. How do you get them to keep on? You tell them it's magic, and we're going to teach you what it is. This is going to be great. It's going to be hard. It's going to be great. You see? But if it's old, it can't be great. It strips that argument away. At the same moment that it lays the ground for a constantly evolving government where rights themselves do not mean the same thing from age to age. 
That's the crisis. It threatens everything. You hear the sheriff last night? Is that the sheriff sitting there? Hi, sheriff. Sorry. And I just want to say in public, I didn't do it. <laughs> so what did he do last night? Why was it compelling? You know what I was thinking about? Who's the greatest American? It has to be George Washington, in my opinion. What did he do? What he did was, first of all, in the beginning, he was a bad general. He had he fought right here, you know. 20 blocks that way was the heart of the battle, south of here. He'd never moved any large bodies of troops around. And the, the British generals were extremely good, and they just danced rings around him, embarrassed him. He, the miracle he escaped with anybody from New York, 1777, early in the year, right? But he learned how to do it. And the next thing you know, I mean, seven years later, he had conquered and expelled from our country the greatest military power on earth. And then he quit. People thought, we want him to be king. Anyway, we've got to build a new government around him. He said, hush your mouth. I'm going home. He gave his sword back to the Congress, made a ceremony of it, and departed. You see, that's the pattern of his life enormous use of force, changed whole battles with his incredible courage and determination, and then stopped and gave us a chance to pick somebody else. Couldn't have had the country without that. When the sheriff saluted us last night, he was reenacting the career of George Washington. Who are we, right? Hey, his whole talk was spiced with the fact that if a cop tells you to do something, you're going to have to do it. And on the scene, you're just going to have to do it, right or wrong. And they'll kill you if they don't. Then later we'll find out if it was a lawful order, which is the check on the executive power, right? He acknowledged all that, but you know, part of it was you need to understand what we are. And the idea that we're going to be turned into nannies and managers of the details of people's private lives. We can keep the peace and enforce the law, he said, right? And then he saluted us. Our government is attacking that now. Those people used to be most of the government. Now they're a small part of it. But don't make the mistake and think that the government is not interested in law enforcement. They are very interested in law enforcement. The EPA, apparently, and the Department of Education, I read, has SWAT cops. They raided the Gibson Guitar Company looking for illegal wood, shut the place up, busted things around, came in in force with their machine gun showing, right? And then found out there wasn't any of that there. So they're interested in force, but they're not interested in the kind of force that enforces laws that we can all understand and that feels compelled not just to protect but also to serve us. Because it works for us. Americans are not supposed to be afraid when they see a cop. They're supposed to think, good news, there's a cop here. Maybe I'll need some help. And if I do, I'll get it. How does school work? We have 13 charter schools now, the Hillsdale Academy, three more chartered, and we're running what by every measure is one of the best colleges in the country. All you have to know is the same doctrines that are in the Declaration of Independence. You have to know the learning is in the student, not in you. They can all do it. Did you ever teach a child to talk? No one ever did. There isn't any place to start. They just learn. They hear and they watch and they learn. And they all do it. They solve 
the mystical, amazing thing that every human being can do and no other being on earth can do. And they all learn to do it. And by that act, by the end of the second year, they are on their way to knowing Shakespeare and physics. When you get them to school, the first step is simple. You have to associate. What they have learned is they have learned that sounds represent things in nature. Chair, dog, man, paper, microphone, right? There are many of all of those things. How do they know? Every time they see one, they know. It's that. And this is the sound for it. Other beings cannot do that. Aristotle says, animals then use their voices to indicate pleasure and pain, but humans use theirs to distinguish the just from the unjust and the advantageous from the disadvantageous. Speech is our gift. Now, marks on a page called writing is just the same thing in a different form. The reason you can always teach them to read, except in the rare case of an impaired child, is because you teach them to associate these sounds that they've already figured out for themselves with the marks on the page. And they're bound to learn to do that. In fact, you'd almost have to stop them learning. But it can be done quickly if you make it systematic. The head of the business roundtable is the former governor of Michigan and a really great guy. I pine for him today. And I spent a couple of hours with him not long ago and he said, do you think the business roundtable should make it a national goal to teach every kid to read by the third grade? And I said, well, I think they can do it in kindergarten. He said, kindergarten, you know. And then he went and got his education guy, right? And he says, he says they can do it in kindergarten. So I come out, you know, and I don't teach kindergarten, so what do I know? And so, and so I asked my staff, Kilgore is sitting back there somewhere where he is. He's really great. He's just a weenie. And uh, I said, you know, I said, kindergarten, is that fair? And he said, well, it'll be safer to say the first or second or third grade. And I said, well, you know, but can't they read in kindergarten? with them? Well, he said, well, they can't read the Federalist Papers. And I said, I said, can you? <laughs> you know, I find them difficult, right? So then I go the next day, just so happens, to my daughter's, our daughter's, eld eldest daughter runs one of the charter schools in Austin, Texas. And I'm in the class with the awesome Mrs. Raritan, who teaches kindergarten in this school. And I've been in her class three times now. Wow, she's just dynamite. And I said, the class ended, you know, and I'd, I'd learned what capacity was, you know? Capacity, you go, today we're gonna learn C, A, P, A, you know, and they're all going, ooh, you know, and she says, capacity. And they go, wow, we're gonna learn capacity, see? It's a magic, she, you're in the thing, right? And I said, you know, one of my guys says to me that you can't reliably te teach them to read by the end of the kindergarten. And she said, shame on him, who was that? <laughs> You see, but why, if you can do that, why can you do it? You can do it because they are born with the capacity to do it, because they are human. Do you know what numbers are? Words are symbols for things in nature. Numbers are, are symbols for the quantities of those things. We all know that. If we teach that, everybody can read Shakespeare and the Federalist Papers and at least get through pre-calculus. I've been disciplined not to say calculus. All our kids have to get through pre-calculus in our charter schools, right? They all have to learn Latin. It's just a language, they can learn it. If you turn away from those natural meanings of things, you destroy education and law and freedom and civilization with a single stroke. That's what's happening. And because of it, a night will descend upon America if we don't stop it. And the good news is, it isn't very hard to know how to stop it. We must restore the laws of nature and of nature's God. Because after all, they do call to us, don't they? Thank you.
Okay, we have time for a few questions. We have two students with microphones. Um, and uh, if you raise your hand, the microphone will be brought to you. Gentleman right down here in the front. Anybody want to say anything? Oh, yes. Rasi, um, this is a repeat. How far do you think we, this country, has gone walking on the road to serfdom? And, uh, and, and what is the end point going to look like? Uh, well, how far, did you hear that? How far on the road to serfdom and what will it look like? Well, a long way and it'll look like serfdom. Um, no, it, um, what is the good of freedom? Which includes, of course, justice, has to. So the good of it is uh, we all get to work and cooperate and do our jobs. Uh, it's the reason Hillsdale College is successful. Everybody rows the boat. You see, we, we don't think of ourselves as providing a service to them. We're all providing each other a service, united in a common activity we all have to, do, to go. So the glory of America is there's never been such an engine to unite people's efforts toward common achievement. It's like a really good baseball team, for example, where they all seem to be doing individual performances, but they win because they cooperate. So uh, there's, a, there's a college down in uh, Guatemala, and uh, I know a lot of people down there. It's a good college. And the kids longed to come up here. And one night down there, I took a bunch of them out to dinner, about 20 of them. And what they noticed about America was that everything works. So now, the first thing that will start happening and is beginning to happen is that things stop working. Also, things can't be paid for anymore that are fundamental. Defense, the cops, the roads, the bridges. And despite the fact that we're borrowing enormous amounts of money from the future, we can't pay for basic stuff, which is, used to be the whole of government. Also, we subsidize people in ways of life that are not good for them, right? They don't, it isn't good to live your life without working. Way better to work. So those things are beginning to happen now. Uh, our public discourse is now mostly all about uh, what group you're in. The thing is a great engine to uh, take care of the newly identified groups. And there's another one every week now. You can't keep up with them all. Uh, I, I'm prepared not to discriminate. I just can't remember who I'm not to discriminate against. So I actually try to follow the, follow the practice of not discriminating against anybody, which requires teaching or treating everybody the same. It's not complicated at Hillsdale College because we don't have any rules not to talk bad about any particular group. We just have lots of rules about being civil to everybody. And you know, lots of rules, it means there's just one. You have to be civil. Uh, Civility is the necessary ground. Friendship is the sufficient ground, and you can't become friends if you're not civil to each other. So we make them do that, right? So the dysfunction is advanced now. Um, it is masked by technology, because, uh, you know, technology is wonderful, right? It's just so good, right? I, I, I have my iPhone here. But you know, I've been doing the same kind of work for a long time, and in very important ways, it's become easier. And you know, I have to travel all the time and keep up with a whole bunch of stuff, and that's just a lot more possible than it used to be. So, so a lot of the decay around us is masked by real achievement, too. But you know, in the last stages, and there's some of this now, you really have to mind what you say. And then, you know, then, 
if you, I'm teaching a course on this uh, next term. Um, have you read C.S. Lewis? And have you read Aldous Huxley? Have you read George Orwell? And have you read Winston Churchill? Because they were contemporaries. And they had many of the same things to say. And I'm teaching a course where we're going to read those similarities. And uh, they're very different people, right? But they saw what's going on, the abolition of man. And I, I will tell you one thing I like about this election is that, uh, and, and here's the opportunity. This is why Churchill thought he could beat Hitler. Overwhelming force on the side of Hitler. Obviously, from the military view, simply hopeless. And what he thought is, he has to be vulnerable. This is ugly. People won't like it or they won't like it for long. Now, it's just the case that 65% of the American people right now say that they are afraid of their government. There has got to be a major political opportunity in that. And in this race, there are some signs of that. People from outside the minority party, which is what it is, flocking to people who promise radical reform not just Donald Trump. So I look at things like that and think, you have to remember, I mean, first of all, I say I believe it. I think that this is like the Civil War and the American Revolution. And those things were won by the skin of our teeth, right? What, what was it like in 1940? How'd they get through that? You know, the answer is only just. And most of the time thinking they probably wouldn't. You see? So it's like that. There isn't any reason to despair. There's actually huge reason to hope. And, you know, if you want to be Spartan about it, and you do, then there's this final reason to hope. In the end, you cannot be compelled to stain yourself. Are you prepared to stand up and to claim against all this, despite the fact that it's powerful? That may be a dangerous thing to do, but it's a good thing to do. In that sense, we are infinitely far from the road to serfdom. Dr. Arne, I would like to state that freedom to me is the right to discipline my child if in my view he's not behaving, etc. So I feel some of that power is being taken away from us by the government. Uh, yeah, and uh, it, uh, remember when that, who, Adrian Peterson, is he the one who was banned from the NFL because he beat his kid with a switch. And so I got a class that day, uh, the day that happened. And you know, the, the students at Hillsdale College are younger, right? I was beaten with a switch. Were you beaten with a switch, you know? I don't, I don't remember it being pleasant, but uh, <laughs> I said in my class, I said, how many of you have ever been beaten with a switch? There were like 10 of them who held up their hand. I said, wow, no wonder you're at Hillsdale College. You know, <laughs> this, this is easy for you now. But I will say that uh, I think you should be allowed to discipline your, your children and also my children. I'll send them to you. <laughs> yeah. Ma'am, you want to say something? Yeah, yeah. He's, bringing, he's bringing the deal. He's not as quick as I hoped he'd be. <laughs> Uh, my question is, is when you appropriately point out that the regulations are now having more rule over us than those that we elect, what do you foresee in, the, in terms of it becoming so onerous that we can no longer control those 
regulatory bodies with the appointed people and that our legislators have then transferred all of the power to them. At, at what point do the scales tip? Do, uh, do we challenge that? And do you feel we can challenge it in a court of law? No, I, I don't. Uh, I agree with, I have a lot of controversial views and I'll apologize for them. Um, I've been unwilling to join the chorus to say that Donald Trump is unfit to run for the President of the United States, although whether I'm for him or not is a different question. And, and I also don't think the courts are the heart of the problem. I think Hamilton was right. The courts are the least dangerous branch. And the reason they are is because they're farthest from the people and because their work proceeds from particular cases that arise. And we have lots of modern examples that when a resolute Congress or executive branch stands up to them, they bend. And uh, what they're very powerful at is that when it's a close run thing and Obamacare is passed by both branches and the people are very divided about it, you know, it's very unpopular, but there are plenty who support it too, then they get a lot of leverage. And they have a lot because of that. But if there's a political decision in the country about the direction of the country, they will fall in line with it, I predict. As they have in the past, in my opinion, consistently. One more question. Dr. Uh, I guess at this time, I'm so very concerned. Your comments on the folks uh, in the American uh, professors, that group and everything, how liberal uh, they are and how liberal the press is. And I don't think they're all stupid people, but what is it they don't see that we see so well? Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, they're, in my opinion, they're neither stupid people nor corrupt. Uh, one, one of the reasons, by the way, I'll bring this up again, that I don't tend to denounce people running for president is that, first of all, I'm not in that line of work, but second, I try to follow the example of Lincoln and Churchill who could make devastating arguments against people, but personal attacks were more rare. So now I'll say about those professors, they're, you know, they're obviously tremendous people. They have enormous talent. You know, to get an academic knowledge of a big subject takes decades and diligence. And so th these are, they're not, as a rule, corrupt people. Nor, by the way, are politicians, in my experience. The trouble is, in my, so this, and see, this is a huge thing to say, right? But I believe it. I think that this thing by Frank Goodnow, that's very gloomy to say that what you teach your students won't really influence them all that much. That's kind of a despairing point, right? But on the other hand, turn it around. Because if it's true that we are shaped by the social conditions, two things follow. One is, it's a very important fact that we know that now. And that means we can focus our attention on those conditions and we can take control of them. We can make the society into whatever we want. The whole direction of historicism in Germany and progressivism in America, it's just its child. And you know, I, I'm not saying anything controversial. That's who they quote when they talk about what they think. Hegel and Kant and those guys, right? But, but just think, this, this is my surface pro. Right? I write on it, I type on it, it stays synced up all the time, I carry my remarks down here, I don't have to go find a printer. You know, I used to, my life used to be driven by looking for a printer. And, uh, you know, I never look for a printer anymore. It's great, it's liberating. But this is really obviously competent. And so John Dewey writes, for example, we must take the techniques that have produced this and we must apply it to people. We must plan and organize the whole society by the scientific method 
and then we can make it as much better than the old society as this is of a computer five years ago. You see, that's the plan, and there's a great hope in it. Everybody can have whatever they want. You see, and our news is bad news, obviously bad news. Why, why do I say to prospective students in Hillsdale College, you gotta remember it's hell. I say to them all the time, you have to suffer. You know, my class that was so tired the other day, I said, remember, you have to suffer. Let's get to it. And they all go, okay, we're gonna suffer. Let's do it, right? You see, what if you didn't have to suffer? That's the hope. Of course it's compelling. Nobody wants anybody to suffer. It's just that if you persuade yourself that the moral and the, well, I'll quote the great man. In the first speech ever given by President of the United States, George Washington says, our republic is founded in the great fact in the whole course and economy of nature, the indissoluble connection between virtue and happiness. Virtue means courage. You might have to suffer. Virtue means moderation. You might not be able to enjoy many things. If you banish the idea that you have to suffer, there will be endless suffering. That's the trouble. Thanks.